Morning, Larry. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. We uh, got a couple of announcements to make. Sharon Revere and that family has um, COVID in his home with the COVID, so we need to uh, definitely remember them. Jackie's daughter, Jackie Harjo's daughter, is now home, so she's doing some better. I tried to get a hold of Betty, uh, or one of her uh, children, and I haven't been able to do that, so I do not have a current update. Last information I had, she was in Kaiser Rehab and would be coming home in a week, and they were trying to figure out a way to do that, to get her home, and I don't know how they're going to do that. So that family really, she really needs our prayers. So I'm just praying for a miracle that she gets some sight back. So uh, really needs our prayers for her, for sure. Um, anything else this morning we need to mention? Beth is having back surgery on Tuesday. Beth McKibben. Beth. McKibben, no. Oh, Mangrum, or Wallace. Wallace, Beth Wallace. Yeah, it used to be Mangrum, yeah, Beth Wallace, okay. Okay, Beth Wallace is having back surgery again on Tuesday. Okay. Okay, Earl continues to get worse and is falling. Going to have to put him in a wheelchair. So, need to remember Earl, but really need to remember Margaret too. She has to deal with that, and take care of him. So, you know how men are; they can be a bit stubborn. So, I guess women can't be that way. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I need to definitely remember Earl and Margaret. Is there uh, anything else that we need to mention this morning before we get started? Dan's home, but he's just back and forth. Yep. He isn't really getting like better, better, is he? It's like. He just can't come up. Yeah, Ray? Ray lost a sister-in-law last week. Jimmy Ray Miller. Okay. That's one thing about getting older, you know. You start losing people around you, so. I always think of my granny. She lost just about every single person. Time. It wasn't for my mother. That was about the last of it. Time she, everybody was. But the time she got to the point, she was like almost 100, though. She had forgot some of them had died, so she was like, it was okay. She was like, it's their birthday, and they were going to call her. So, I mean, you know, I guess some of it was all right, Thomas, you know. But, but she did, a lot of grief in her life. Um, any other thing we need to mention this morning? Buck, can we lead us in a word of prayer? Amen. All right, what's legalism? Good question this morning, Galatians 5 and 6. What's legalism? Yeah, but beyond that, what is it in the church? What's legalism in religion? You think what? What? Um, I don't know. That's a good. It's a. It's. A, it's really not a hard question, but it's uh, in our in the church today as compared to them. We're going to look at that this morning. What's legalism? You know what? Well, legalism is really defining your faith on legality. In other words, doing it all the right way. That's really what legalism. It's binding it as far as 
there's certain things you have to do, and if you don't do those things, it's going to condemn you. That's legalism, and binding that upon other people. That's what legalism is. Um, it's a fine line in religion, in Judaism, I guess, or Christianity, between what exactly is binding, what's not binding. Do we, do we uh, you know, it's one of those hard questions. At what point are things important enough that you say, yeah, you got to do it? And you know, what things are important, not important enough that you say, well, it's all right, one way or another, it's all right. You know, what's legalism? Uh, legalism is depending on law for your salvation, depending on your action for your salvation, and binding that upon other people. That's what legalism is. So, you know, I think in the church especially, there's a lot of things we do. It's a good question we need to ask ourselves. Um, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, do not become subject again to a yoke of slavery. You know, Paul really starts with this idea, you know, Galatians, into Galatians 3, Galatians 4, about the free and the bond and how we're all heirs of, of uh, Abraham through Jesus Christ now. You know, what a great, what a great passage of Scripture that is. And then when he gets into Galatians 5, it says it's for freedom that Christ set us free. That seems kind of like a contradictory statement in a sense, doesn't it? Uh, but, but what he means by that is that we're, they're binding themselves again to a yoke of slavery. I think in the church, you know, that's something that we have to think about. You know, have we, do we bind ourselves to a yoke? And what that means is, is you know, are the things that we do that we bind upon ourselves, uh, can we go too far with that? Absolutely. You know, absolutely you can. In this case, it's Judaizers, people who were still holding to the law of Moses. And they were trying to force that upon other people, other Christians. They were telling Christians, they said, well, you're saved, you know. Paul would say, saved by grace through faith. Right? Paul just said, you know, you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. So I've been baptized into Christ. I clothe yourself with Christ. It says that, Galatians. They would say, well, you're saved, you know, but you got to do this stuff. Yeah. Can I what? Oh. Okay. I guess I'll go over here. Anyway, so we start talking about that. You know, what are we, what are they, what are they trying to do? And what, and how do we do that same thing? He says, I, Paul, say to you, and this really comes down to circumcision. You know, circumcision was a, the binding covenant between Abraham and God, or Abraham's descendants and God, basically the Hebrew nation and God. But the problem is, and what Paul would say, and really if you go back into Galatians 3, what Paul would say is that does not change the promise made to Abraham. In other words, you know, the covenant doesn't change all that stuff. So now he's going all the way back to Abraham, and he's saying, you know, that, that covenant of circumcision, it was between the Jew. It was to, to show Abraham and, and, uh, and that relationship, and that covenant goes all the way back to Abraham, but when Jesus Christ died on the cross, there's a new covenant, right? There's a new covenant. In other words, that's what did away with that covenant, not the law. See, that's what Paul would say. He would say, listen, the law never did away with the covenant of Abraham. That's what he talks about in Galatians 3. Never did away with that. The law never did away with that covenant to Abraham. But what did, what did do away with that covenant to Abraham? Right? And what did away with that covenant to Abraham was the covenant Jesus Christ made for, with us on the cross. We're under the new covenant now. They were never under a different covenant in the Old Testament. What covenant God made to Abraham was the covenant they were under. The law came into place, Paul would say, 430 years later. Remember what we read in Galatians 3 Wednesday night? That didn't undo a covenant previously ratified. You can't add terms or conditions. The only way you can get rid of a covenant or a contract, is you have to get rid of the whole contract, right? You can't amend it without both parties. And that's what Paul, that was the argument Paul was making in Galatians. You can't amend the contract. The only way you can get 
The only way you can do anything with the contract is totally to, to get rid of it. It has to end. There has to be an end. First, to have a new covenant with Jesus Christ, the old covenant has to end. Does that make any sense? Because we're not under that covenant anymore. It's a new covenant. We're under a new covenant. So Paul, but these Jews are saying, listen, you got to be circumcised. Now this isn't meaning anything to us today. But you have to understand there's great parallels in Scripture of other things. They were binding upon them an act or a right and said, this is necessary for your salvation, is what they were doing. When they did that, and they bound that on them, then that became legalism, became law. And Paul argues that if you're under law, you have to keep it all. You either got to be under that covenant or you got to be under this covenant. You can't walk on both sides. You can't walk on both sides of the line. So what's that mean to you and me today? I preached, I was somewhere teaching a class or something one time. wasn't here. I think it was in Okima. And uh, I brought up the point that the law, we were no longer under the law. The law had been done away with. And when I got done with that class, somebody called me aside and they said, well, that's true, all but the Ten Commandments. And I said, do you keep the Sabbath? And they said, well, not that one. I'm like, you can't, you can't do that, <laughs> right? I mean, you can't, you can't say, well, we're only, we're under the nine, <laughs> right? <laughs> you can't do that, you know, because that covenant's been replaced. And you and I, we... We had sometimes, even uh, even we have a hard time wrapping our head around that concept that, you know, that big body of Old Testament law no longer is over us. And it does, you know, and when you talk to Messianic Jews, and uh, who, who I really love, by the way, I just love talking to them, love being around them, but I don't agree with them all the time, you know, and that's just one of those things. And I talk to a messianic Jew teacher. I guess you would still call him a rabbi. I don't know. Anyway, one time, and uh, and he and that's what I told him. I said, "Why do you keep? You know, do you expect me to keep Passover? Do you expect me to keep the Sabbath? You know?" And he said, uh, "Well, you will." And I said, "No, I don't. I don't think I will, uh, because that's done away with." It's not, I don't need to do that. You see what I'm saying? It's not, I'm not under that law anymore. And uh, he said, well, we take the crucifixion. We take Christ to be this. I said, well, do you sacrifice? And he says, oh, no. We take Jesus to be the ultimate sacrifice. And I said, well, how can you take all the rest of that in the law all that talk about sacrifice and say, well, now we don't do that part, but we're going to do all this other part. I said, how do you justify that, you see? And so that's kind of where they're at here. Paul says, you have been severed. You who are seeking to be justified by law. This is a really hard passage for people who believe in once saved, always saved, I might add. Uh, you have been severed from Christ. Cut off, Right? If you want to be justified by the things you do, now this is where it starts talking about Christianity. If you expect to be justified by what you do, that's never going to get you to heaven. Ever. Does it mean there's not certain things we should do? Doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean that at all. But it means if you expect to go to heaven, your salvation is based on your keeping certain things, doing certain things you got a problem. It's not going to happen. He says, um, you've fallen from grace. So when you think about that idea, so were these people, do you think, these people, 
Do you think these people were saved and they're no longer saved? Is that how you would read that passage? You know, how can you fall from some place you've never were? You ever thought about that? You know, if they weren't in a state of grace, then how could they have fallen from a state of grace? And so Paul's very blunt about this. He says, we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. But faith working through love. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. You know, this is written to a region of churches, right? Galatians, not to a single church. So whoever's spreading this is probably going from place to place. Paul doesn't name him. Does that mean Paul doesn't know who he is? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, I don't know. But he doesn't name him. But he says this person is traveling around, he's spreading this stuff, he's convincing you of this stuff, and you don't need to do that. You don't need to be hindered from obeying the truth. You don't need to follow what this person says. You know, there comes a point where you have to know what's right and you have to stand up what's right. He says, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. Paul's a little satirical here. If I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In other words, he's not preaching circumcision, right? He's not persecuted. He says the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. What's the stumbling block of the cross he's talking about here in this case? What's the stumbling block of the cross? We're talking about needing to be circumcised, needing to keep the law. He started this out. He said, for freedom Christ set us free. So in Paul's little satirical comment here, because that's what it is, His little satirical comment. What's the stumbling block of the cross? Yeah, that you don't have to do that anymore. That's become a stumbling block. The very fact that you don't have to keep the law has become a stumbling block to people. They can't get past it. They've done it that way so long, they can't get past that. So he says that stumbling block of the cross would be abolished if I'm still preaching circumcision. He says, I wish those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. And that's really strong terminology. He basically, he, he means he wish they would castrate themselves is what this really means. He wish they would just castrate themselves, mutilate themselves. He's, you know, to him, what they're doing is so wrong that he's basically saying if they think circumcision is a thing, then maybe they just ought to try castration, you know, we'll go the whole way, right, is what he's trying to say. I wish they would just mutilate themselves. So he's really trying to be as severe as he can about this. He says, you are called to freedom. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. What he means by turning freedom into opportunity to the flesh is, is that they're free to do that. They're free to be circumcised if they wanted to do that. You know, he circumcised Timothy. He didn't have to do that, but he did. But he didn't circumcise Titus, right? Paul didn't circumcise Titus. So he says this freedom allows you to do things. You're free to do it. But he says don't allow that to become an opportunity to the flesh. In other words, don't become that a way to exalt yourself. Well, I was circumcised, right, because of this. That's what he's saying, a point of boasting or whatever. Don't, let, don't allow that to happen. Don't let that happen. So, so he says walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry the desire of the flesh. He says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for they're in opposition to one another. Paul, way above any other writer in the Bible, he always proposes this thought more than anybody else, that spirit and flesh are always against each other, always. Paul really talks about that a lot, that our flesh is always against our spirit, and our spirit is always against our flesh. They're almost... In Paul's view, almost irreconcilable to one another. And I I kind of agree with that. Paul is really a big guy about the fact that we're accountable, you and me. It's not Satan and God. It's not good and evil. The ultimate battle in Paul's mind is within ourselves, the battle within us. And the battle between our flesh and our spirit, the battle that you and I have to fight, that that it's our battle. 
that God contributes to that, that Satan can tempt us, but ultimately, Paul says, just in us. And I really agree with that. I really agree with that idea that Paul brings forth. It's within you and I, the battle that we fight. The deeds of the flesh are evident. So Paul wants to say the spirit and the flesh are against each other. So how do you know which side you're walking on? Will be Paul's thought. And he says, well, it's easy. Because the deeds of the flesh. And it's really interesting because he goes into this idea of circumcision and this doing this act, and you don't need to be circumcised. But then he also says, but what you do matters, you know? What you do matters. The way you live in your flesh matters. And the deeds of the flesh become evident. In more immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions. He says these are the deeds of the flesh. This is the war we fight, you and I, every day, against these things. These are what the flesh desires. This is what the flesh does. But he says, envy, drunkenness, carousing, things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he just said that, you know, being bound to the law, legalism, circumcision, that was a, something you didn't need to do. But now he says, but if you practice these things, and see, that's where, we, that's where the fight is. I don't know how to say this right. I really want to tell you something this morning, and it's right in here, that it just isn't coming out of my mouth. Um, that's the fight, and I don't know exactly how to terminate. I don't, know how to, I don't exactly know how to articulate this thought. But the fight is... In Christianity, the fight within us, I think, and within the church is, where do you draw the line between the stuff that you need to do to be a Christian, the deeds, the things in the flesh you need to do, and the things that we bind as being legality, legalism? You see, it's such a hard line sometimes to draw that. It's so hard to draw that line. I cannot articulate this thought. Y'all is welcome to help. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that's a, one of those things on that society. Circumcision was to the male, you know, not, and there was no real female. Well, it was a covenant that said he's a Hebrew. Basically, it was the covenant. It didn't really save him. I mean, I think what it did was the circumcision, a, sign, a covenant always has to have a sign. I mean, when you get married, right, what do you do? You give rings, right? And before, if you couldn't afford rings, you used to tie the knot, right? You're right, they'd put their hands together, the preacher would tie a knot over their hands. That's where that came from, in case you didn't know, because you couldn't afford rings. So they put their hands together, and the preacher would take a rope, and he would tie a knot, tie their hands with a knot, and that would be the symbol. That's what that's where that comes from, tie the knot, if you all didn't know that. but And uh, so anyway, he would tie the knot. But there was always a symbol of that. If you sign a contract in a lawyer's office, what do you have? To, I just said it, right? What do you have to do? You have to sign it. And if you can't, if back in the days you were illiterate and you couldn't sign it, what did you have to do? You had to make your mark, right? In other words, a covenant always has, there's always a symbol of covenant. Now, a circumcision couldn't save a Jew because, number one, when did they circumcise the male Jews? Eight days, right? So in other words, circumcision could not save them. It wasn't a conscious decision on their part in any respect. What circumcision was is it was a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. It was a sign of that covenant. Well, Galatia is not really a Jewish region, so I'm going to say it's Gentiles being influenced by Jewish, by Jews. Right. Yeah. 
So now, right, we're not under that covenant. And this is probably the best way to understand this. So now, how, what's the sign of our covenant now? Baptism, right? So when you're baptized, that's the sign of your covenant with God. So that's the new covenant. But since we're not under Abraham's covenant, we don't circumcise. So circumcision didn't save them. But what circumcision did was it, it showed that it was an outward sign of the covenant of God, right? Outward sign of that covenant that they made with God. So baptism is a covenant now we make with Christ. That is our physical, that is our physical showing of the covenant that we make with Jesus Christ with baptism. What Paul says is you don't need this old covenant anymore because this covenant is gone. Covenant doesn't exist. The covenant was what? How, how come does that covenant, why does that covenant not exist anymore? Because I don't know how to say that question right either. I'm having a hard time this morning. Yeah, it was fulfilled exactly what I was looking for. It was fulfilled in Christ. The covenant didn't go away, right? A covenant always has an end date. Am I right about that? Contracts always have an end date. You know, there's always at some point where that contract's terminated. Um, when you get married, what's the end date? Yeah, that's right. But there's always an end date, <laughs> all right? And it's the same way with the covenant of Abraham. It had an end date. And the end date, according to the Old Testament, of the covenant of Abraham, you really get that in Genesis, right, where it says, uh, till the scepter won't depart until the one to whom it belongs comes in Genesis. Um, 2 Samuel 7, where he talks to David about putting one on his throne. The end date of the, of the, Abraham, of the Abrahamic covenant was Jesus Christ. He came to fulfill the law. That's what he said. I come to fulfill it. When I die on the cross, the law, that's the end date of that covenant. It's been replaced come to an end because I fulfilled that contract because the contract to Abraham was what in your seed all nations shall be blessed that was the contract to Abraham right and when Jesus Christ died on the cross according to what Paul says in Galatians right he became a curse for us by hanging on a tree curses everyone that hangs upon a tree Galatians 3 when Jesus Christ was hung on the cross it terminated that contract because it fulfilled the terms of the contract. In your seed, all nations shall be blessed. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the contract to Abraham that God made to Abraham was fulfilled. All nations were blessed. Well, just for the Hebrews, right? Yeah. Yeah. But now... It was for the whole world. And the contract was fulfilled when Jesus hung on the cross. The contract was fulfilled. And that contract, because of its fulfillment, not because God ever canceled it, but because it was fulfilled, that contract became null and void. And Jesus gave us a new covenant, right? A new covenant. Paul goes into that a lot in Romans, right? He gave us a new covenant in Jesus Christ. And that's what we live under now. So he says, those who belong to Jesus have been crucified with his passions and desires. Paul talks about that a lot. Gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law. What does that, what exactly does that mean? There is no law. Law only does what? Condemns, Right? If you do the right thing, there's no law for that. Does that make it? There's no law to do the right thing. There's a law not to do the wrong thing. There's not a law to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, there's no law against it. There's no law against the right thing. That's not what law is for. That's what righteousness is for. 
It says, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us become, not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And then he says, if anyone is caught in trespass, you are a spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Now let's not get out of context of the passage. He's talking about those forcing them to be circumcised. And then he says, if you're caught in a trespass, you are a spiritual, restore such a one. So Paul says, you need to teach the right thing. Restore them. Bring them back. Don't be tempted yourself. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Bear each other's burdens. You know, Paul talks about that very idea, the idea of carrying the burden of a brother. Um, you know, Jesus will bear our burdens, and we talk about that a lot. But boy, when we don't share our burdens with each other, we really miss out on the blessings of being a Christian. I'm just here to tell you that. You know, sometimes people can't fix things. A lot of times people can't fix things. You can share something with somebody, they might not be able to fix it. But just having somebody that knows your problems and your struggles and helps you along the way is invaluable. It's invaluable. Just to have some just to know that people love you for who you are. That's invaluable to me, you know? Because so many times we think, boy, if people really knew who we were, they wouldn't love us, right? I do some really stupid things sometimes. I mean, really stupid things sometimes, right? And, and you know, those of you who know me, you know that, right? I mean, you know I'm just a guy that has all kinds of problems, but you love me anyway. Right? And that's great. I mean, that's what I want. Because I don't want to have to put up a facade around people I love. You know, I just want you to love me for who I am. I don't want to have to be somebody or try to be somebody that I'm not. I just want you to know that I try hard and I do the best I can. And guess what? Sometimes I make huge blunders and I just hope you love me anyway. Right? You know, and that's really what it means by bearing each other's burdens. So many times in the church over the years... And, you know, I saw this with my cousin. When I was young, in Grand Junction growing up, you know, my Aunt Audra and my granny, they were the ones who really were in church like every Sunday. And, I mean, my mom was too, but they were the ones who were really like the backbone of it, you know. And my Aunt Audra had two boys, Steve and Dan, my two cousins. And then Granny took my sister and me and then all the other herd of kids she always had. But, you know, but, the, but Steve and Dan, they, they left religion, faith. I mean, I'm not going to get into specifics of, you know, they left this religion or that religion. I'm just saying they just left God, you know. I mean, let's just leave it at that. They left God. They grew up the same way I did. They grew up around a lot of the same influences I had. But their Aunt Audra, their mother, she had a lot of struggles in her life. But when she walked into the church building, she was perfect. You know what I'm saying? You know, she dressed it, she acted it, she talked it, she walked it. She was perfect. And Steve and Dan, their view of religion became that it was just a facade. You know, that it wasn't real. That it's something you did but then when you left the building, you could fall apart. And, that, and they just didn't see God in that. And they've never, ever, neither one of them ever, come to church, been in a church building, accepted God since then. I, on the other hand, was raised with my grandmother, who lived God every day of her life, and struggled every day of her life, and all these trials in her life every day. And what I saw in her was great faith. And I saw God every day in her life. But, I, but they didn't see that. What they saw was this, was this, this facade. The church is this perfect place for perfect people and dress up and put on your best clothes and come to church and act perfect and smile and shake everybody's hand and tell everybody that everything's okay and life is wonderful and everybody's good. And, and then when you leave the building, none of that's true. 
And that was their view. It's not true. It's not real. It's not because it's not something you carry with you every day. And I think, you know, that's a disservice we do to people. Is we say, well, my life's perfect because I'm a Christian. My life is way from perfect. Way, 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 way from perfect. It's blessed, right? I mean, but when we don't say that with one another, we really negate the gospel. Because the gospel, Christianity, faith, is not about just being here with each other on Sunday morning. I can I can put on a good show for a couple hours a week. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I can do a pretty good job, right? I can make you think I'm Mr. Wonderful for a couple hours a week if I try hard enough. But that's not what faith's about. That's not why that's not come fellowship's so important and eating with one another is so important. And, you know, fellowship dinners are so important. And being with one another, besides just in this building, is so important because, because it lets us learn that we're just people and that we all have our problems and there's things about me you don't like and I'm sure there's probably things you do that I probably don't like either, but that's all right. Right? That's okay. Because that's what family is, and that's what the church is, and that's what Paul's saying. Bear each other's burdens. But you can't bear a burden that you don't know about. Am I right? You know, you can't bear a burden for somebody if they don't share it with you. And that doesn't mean you have to share your problems with the world. I grew up in churches of testimonials, and people did that all the time, and I, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I'm not really for it. But... But I don't think it means you've got to stand up and share your problems with the world. But what it does mean within the body of Christ is that you need to find people within this congregation, within this body, that you're comfortable with enough that you can be you. And that you can let them know what's going on and that you can share things with them and it's okay. And I think that's what Paul means. To bear each other's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Because Christ doesn't want us to be alone. He never designed us to be alone, ever. Never did. Never designed us for that. It says, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And what Paul means by this is exactly what I was just telling you. Paul says it in his own way. He says, in other words, if you think you don't have problems, right, <laughs> then you're, dece you're deceiving yourself, because we all do. That's what Paul's saying. If you don't think you have a problem, if you don't think you have a burden, then you're deceiving yourself. Because if you're old enough, all of us are packing stuff, right? I mean, there's not a person sitting here this morning, I guarantee you, that's not packing something. And if you're not, just wait till tomorrow, <laughs> right? You know, because you're going to be. You know, I'm just telling you, it's just life. It's, No, he's talking about those who are being influenced by these people who are going in and teaching them the wrong thing, that you need to bring them back. And that you need to bear the burden, help them bear the burden that they're bearing. Why are they wanting to be circumcised? Why is this person having an effect on them? Why do people, me and Brent kind of talked about this a little bit the other day on the phone, you know, why do people want somebody to tell them what to do to be saved? I mean, that's what's going on, right? I mean, isn't that what's going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. I told Brent, you know, the hardest thing about really being an honest preacher, I think, is getting rid of the absolutes. You know, because it was so, in all my childhood, you know, that's what I heard from the pulpit was these absolutes. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Right? And that is, people like that. Some people relish that. Because they want to leave here on Sunday morning and think, oh, I got that. <laughs> right? I mean, this, 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 I can do that, right? But if you really preach the truth of God's word, it's not ever about, God was never really about absolutes. He was always about, boy, there's so many examples of this. It's hard for me even to give you one that I think would be appropriate, but, but, I think you do a disservice. Right, it's not. 
Uh-uh. Yeah. Just this far out of reach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You could do it. Right. And you can. I mean, it's possible. You know, God didn't give us... It seems unattainable, but I don't think God... I think God wouldn't give us something we couldn't do. I think He gives us something we sometimes choose not to do. But All right. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. It's just easy to use the Bible... I mean, I can't tell you, when I was a kid, you know, it was a big thing. I heard a lot of sermons, you know, don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, don't. You know, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit from a preacher who was 150 or 200 pounds overweight, sweating profusely behind the podium saying, don't smoke because your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to destroy it. And I'm thinking, you know, what's the difference, right? Gluttony? I mean, you know, where do you, where do you stop with that? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, it's. You know, you can't, when you try to box things and give people these big yes and no's, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. I think step beyond what God wants you to do because it's like Brent says, Christianity, Christ, is about these wonderful precepts of, of faith that, you know, if you can incorporate that into your life, then it changes who you are and it changes who you are in God's kingdom. But so many times people don't want the reach for the unattainable, they want the, this is what you don't do. And as long as you don't do this, it's okay, right? But that's not what the Bible's about. That's not what Paul's about. Yeah. Right, it's a continuing verb. In other words, uh, you know, it's a continuing action. doesn't mean you're never going to have an outburst of anger, but it says if every day you wake up and blow up, right, there's a problem, right? In other words, you know, practicing what's not true, what's not right. If you practice it, you know, and he even talks about that with sexual immorality, homosexuality. He talks about those things. If you practice it, that's your problem. Does it mean you're not going to have issues with it sometimes? No. You might do it, but there's a difference between occasionally letting something happen in a moment and practicing that all the time. You're absolutely right, and that's a great point. And to practice righteousness in God's in in the in the mind of Scripture, we practice righteousness. Overall, that's what we should practice in our lives: peace, joy, love. Spirit, you know, those are the things we should practice. And uh, you know what they say, right? Practice makes perfect. Right? So if you practice bad things, you'd be perfect at being bad. But if you practice good things, then hopefully, Brent might argue with me, hopefully we'll be perfect at being good. Right? So that's what we got to strive to do. Practice those things in our life. Right? That's right. And because I'm helping you carry it, you know. I mean, that was a lot of what he said. You know, I'm going to help you carry that, you know. And you're not doing it by yourself. And you're going to have other people around you to help you carry it. And you're not going to have to do it by yourself. Many hands make light work, right? And I'm just thankful in this congregation. I really feel like I can be me. And it's okay. And that's, that's a big thing for me. Because of growing up, the church I grew up growing up, I really didn't feel like I could be me, right? Because I felt like everybody else was too perfect, and I couldn't match up. But, um, no. Yeah. That's right. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, yeah, and you want to choose who you share stuff with carefully. Because, you know, some people some people aren't good aren't good burden bearers. Some people are, right? So you want to trust yourself to people who you can trust and, and rely on. So I think it's important who you choose. Yeah. Thanks for your time this morning.